Right, good morning. Uh, so today we'll start off with uh, the next part of our course on mineral admixtures. Uh, most often we also call them as supplementary cementing materials. <coughs> That's because many of them are used as partial replacement for cement in concrete. But very often we also use fillers which may or may not have any uh, chemical action. So because of that, the general term is mineral admixtures, but the more uh, scientifically accepted term for materials that produce additional cementing properties is supplementary cementing materials. <coughs> now, we talked br briefly about cement hydration in the uh, first segment of this course. The idea is that as hydration proceeds, the porosity gradually fills up with the products of hydration, right? What are these products? CSH primarily, then, <coughs> sorry, calcium hydroxide and ettringite and probably later monosulfate and other calcium aluminate hydrates, right? As the filling up of the porosity happens, the solid phase in the system increases and the amount of void space decreases. So, progressive hydration leads to a decrease in the voids content. So, in other words, it reduces voids, reduces pore connectivity, increases the gel to space ratio. That means, the volume occupied by the solids increases with respect to time. Okay? And there is also an increase in the bound water content. What is bound water? Water that is chemically bound in the structure of the hydration products. In CSH, the H basically is the water that is bound in the calcium silicate structure. Calcium hydroxide, if you heat it up at 500 degrees Celsius, you will remove the water that is bound within the structure of calcium hydroxide. Okay? Now, what happens in regular concrete is also an effect of the way that we mix paste and aggregate and the way that our microstructure variations happen within the system that the zone which is next to the aggregate is usually much more porous as compared to the zone that is further away from the aggregate. Okay? And we call this concept as the interfacial transition zone. And very often this is a cause for most of the issues related to strength and durability of concrete. Incidentally, it also turns out microstructurally that because of the conditions favorable for crystalline formation, right, there is more calcium hydroxide that is seen in the zones next to the interface. Further away from the interface, you see a greater distribution of CSH and other hydration products. But at the interface, you see a lot more of calcium hydroxide. Okay. Now, calcium hydroxide in itself is a good solid material. It blocks pore spaces. So, it is contributing to the strength. But it is also a phase that gets easily chemically attacked. In some instances, the quick reaction of calcium hydroxide in a chemical attack scenario is beneficial. For instance, in carbonation, the attack on calcium hydroxide is beneficial because it creates a barrier of calcium carbonate. But in many other instances, the presence of calcium hydroxide is a deterrent to a good performance. For instance, in sulphate attack or chloride attack, when you have calcium hydroxide reacting, you produce phases that are either soluble or weak. Right? When chlorides attack concrete, the chloride will react with calcium hydroxide to produce what? Calcium chloride and calcium chloride is highly soluble. So, you essentially increase the porosity of your system because calcium hydroxide is getting dissolved away. If sulphates attack calcium hydroxide, what forms? Gypsum, calcium sulphate, right? Gypsum. Gypsum will form as a result of calcium hydroxide interacting with sulphate. And this gypsum again is much weaker as compared to your calcium hydroxide or other cementitious phases. So, you are slowly reducing your strength capacity of the concrete. So, essentially presence of calcium hydroxide is good from the point of view of balancing pH, from the point of view of providing some porosity that is filled up with calcium hydroxide, right? But at the same time, it may act as a deterrent when it comes to chemical attack, okay? So, the other aspect is the void spaces are not getting filled up well enough. If the void spaces are not filled up properly, then your pores are going to be interconnected 
and if you have interconnected pores, it is going to lead to higher permeability in the system and when higher permeability is there, your durability is going to be poorer. So, the key to ensuring durable concrete is to ensure that the pore spaces have been sufficiently filled up. Now, which is the compound in cement hydration products which can have the most efficient filling of pore spaces? Sorry? CSH. Why? Because of its irregular structure, because of its sheet like structure, very high surface area, it is able to really provide extremely dense packing in your system. On the other hand, calcium hydroxide, ettringite, these are very well defined crystals. So, they unless they pack very tightly, they will obviously leave a lot of void spaces behind. So, conversion of calcium hydroxide to CSH is a phenomenon that will lead to more efficient filling up of available pore space. That is why conversion of calcium hydroxide to CSH and also the optimization of the grain size by using minerals that are not of the same fineness as cement, some coarse, some fine. If you mix it up with the cement, there is a much more efficient packing of the entire system that happens and this is where your mineral additives become important to use in concrete. So, two primary aspects, one is mineral additives should have reactive silica that can convert the calcium hydroxide to CSH. Mineral additives should have an optimized grain structure or grain size distribution that can nicely fit into the gaps that are provided by the cement concrete so that you can optimize the packing of the system. Those are the two ways to look at it. Secondly, we also know very well that not all of the cement that we put in concrete will hydrate. Theoretically, you need about 0.23 gram of water for hydration of 1 gram cement. That means, any water to cement ratio above 0.23 should lead to complete hydration of cement, but this is not true. Whatever additional water that you add, some of that also has to go into the gel pore spaces, interlayer pore spaces of the, of the cementitious gel, hydrated cement gel. As a result, not all of the water is used up for hydration, right? And very often, it is not physically possible for all the water to get to all the sites where cement is present. Because again, when you form the hydrated structure, you form a barrier to the easy entry of water or easy movement of water. So, definitely, it is not going to be conceivable for each and every grain of cement to get hydrated. And as a result, you have a condition where some cement sits there simply as a filler. It is not doing anything, but cement has a role as a filler. Oh, well, that is a very stupid thing to do, right? Put cement in there, but it is not reacting, it is just acting like a filler. What is the point? There again, your fine metal additives are providing an additional advantage by reducing the amount of cement that you put in your concrete. We know that that is a justifiable cause for sustainability of the concrete and we are still filling up the pore spaces instead of using excessive cement in the system. So, overall, if you look at the impact, sustainability impact of metal admixtures, you are hitting on all the right points with respect to the definition of sustainability. If you look at the general definition of sustainability, it has to have the process or the product or the technology has to satisfy what is known as a triple bottom line. The triple bottom line of sustainability in, in includes environmental, social and economic effects to be satisfied by the process or the technology that you choose. Okay. So, environmentally, obviously, you are reducing cement. So, that is a big thing for concrete because you know that 6 to 7 percent of total CO2 emissions are coming from cement manufacture. So, less cement used in concrete means less impact of the cement in concrete. Okay. Then, of course, many of these mineral additives are waste or byproducts. They are coming out of other industries and are not going to find useful utilization unless you use it in very large bulk applications and construction is obviously one of the largest applications you can imagine. So, you are definitely leading to a much more better environmental impact when you replace cement with personalic materials or with supplementary cementing materials. Socially, what produces social impact in construction? Your construction should be durable, your construction should uh, be such that cracking and other problems are avoided. Typically, the cracking which happens because of use of higher cement contents is either because of 
thermal effects of shrinkage. If you can restrict these cracks, then socially your technology becomes a lot more acceptable. So, certainly metal additives can help you on that front. Okay. And then obviously the benefit to cost ratio is the scoring point with respect to the environmental conditions, uh, economic conditions that need to be satisfied. Very clearly, we spend a lot of money in repairing damage of concrete structures due to reinforcement corrosion and very clearly the evidence indicates that the use of mineral additives reduces the potential for corrosion and therefore the required maintenance of concrete structures subjected to corrosion also gets reduced when you use mineral admixture. So, obviously you are leading to a better service life and as a result you also get increased benefit to cost ratio. So, on all three fronts related to sustainability, the use of mineral admixtures clearly scores and that is where we have to realize today that it would, I have gone on several fora saying that if you use plain cement in concrete today, it is a criminal waste, criminal waste of resources and you are causing unnecessary additional CO2 emissions, you are causing your concrete to have a higher embodied energy. So, it is very important for us to now cut down the extent of cement that we use in our concrete. Unfortunately, in many of the uh, uncontrolled construction projects, right, like uh, when you have probably seen your neighbors or your parents build their residences, you would have seen these trucks dump the material on the ground. They cover up the road, does not matter whose construction it is, nobody seems to bother that general traffic has to pass on the road, they will put it on the road. In any case, what you see there happening is, there is only cement, sand and stone. Nobody uses any other material because they do not know. Luckily today, in such projects, you can only get Portland porcelain cement. So, you are getting automatically a fly ash based cement. So, without their knowing, they are actually using cement that has fly ash. If you had left the choice to them, they would say, no, 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 I do not want any waste in my cement, right. So, today the policy has been dictated such that the trade users, that is the people who do common construction, they have to only get Portland porcelain cement. They cannot buy ordinary Portland cement. OPC is only available for infrastructure usage in our country and that is a very big step towards reducing the cement clinker usage in concrete. Okay. So, the primary reaction we have already talked about in our overview of cement chemistry is that the amorphous silica from the mineral additive, when it has amorphous silica, combines with the calcium hydroxide from cement hydration to form additional CSH and as we just discussed before, additional CSH is better from the perspective of blocking porosity, right. Sometimes your mineral additive may also contain some calcium oxide. So, it may have a cementitious effect also. That means, the source of calcium and silicon is coming directly from the mineral additive itself like slag for instance. So, slag can produce CSH without the need for combination with calcium hydroxide because there is sufficient calcium provided by the slag itself. Okay. Of course, the additional mechanism of action is also as a filler. It can act as a filler and produce a concrete that is more dense or more compact. Now, very often people confuse this increasing density of concrete. Now, we are not increasing density in a numerical sense. We are not changing the density of concrete from 2.4 to 2.8 or something like that. That is high density concrete. That is totally different. You cannot achieve that by replacing cement with mineral additives. How is that achieved? How do you obtain high density concrete? No, but how, why should that increase density of concrete? Density, the actual numerical value of density. What is the only way to do that? You have to change the aggregate because aggregate is basically 75 to 80 percent of your mass in concrete. If you change the aggregate to a high density aggregate, automatically you change the mass of the concrete or density of the concrete. When we say increase in density, it just means increase in the packing of your system, that is all. Improvement in packing, reduction in voids in your system because all this is happening in the paste, right, which is only one fraction. So, it is you are not changing the density significantly. Now, one has to be very careful about what are the potential sources of materials that can be used as cement replacement. It has to be clearly something that is available in very large tonnages for a long period of time. If you discover some new material, but there is only one deposit in a very finite area, 
that does not really come up as a good solution for a long term usage for cement replacement. So, you have to evaluate these sources very carefully. This is data from some time ago, but it still is quite valid. Obviously, limestone is available a plenty. Only problem with limestone is that the cement grade limestone that is the high purity limestone the high purity limestone is available in a much lesser quantity and in many instances the limestone deposits that may be available may also be within forest reserves. In India it is estimated that out of all the limestone that is available nearly 80 to 85 percent is in forest reserves which cannot be mined and from the limestone that is getting mined only a small fraction of that is available as cement quality limestone. So, generally high purity means calcium oxide content of greater than 44 percent. High purity limestone means CaO content should be greater than 44 percent. In some instances you get even purer forms, in some instances you get less, less pure forms. So, as long as both these forms are available in your mine, you can mix the two and get it to 44 plus. But what if you are only getting low grade limestone, you are not going to be able to use it directly for cement manufacture. So, limestone as a raw material for cement manufacture may be getting lesser and lesser in quantity as we move forward. I mean people have several sorts of numbers, but estimations say that if we produce only OPC today, only OPC, no blended cement, if you only produce OPC today, the stock of limestone reserves will only last us 40 to 50 years, that is it. After that no concrete, okay. but Luckily, we have shifted to alternative cements. So, we can reduce the amount of limestone usage to produce the cement. But anyway, limestone is available. So, as long as limestone is available, obviously cement is available. But compared to cement, if you look at the quantities of the raw materials that are available as supplementary materials, fly ash is available a plenty. There is a lot of fly ash available. But a lot of this fly ash is not of the right quality. The significant volumes are available, but much of that is actually low quality. So, today a lot of research effort in major universities around the world is about how we can reclaim the fly ash of poorer quality and process it to make it high enough quality, right. You may have seen in thermal power plants, they collect fly ash, but they also have this bottom ash which does not fly out. I will talk about that. A lot of the fly ash is basically getting dumped in uh, ponds next to the uh, thermal power plant because you cannot dispose it in a solid form, it is a very fine material, it will start flying off. So, you have to mix it with water and dump the slurry in a pond. Now, these fly ashes from the ponds, they may have some heavy metals which will slowly seep into the groundwater and that is something which can cause contamination of the groundwater and that is an un unacceptable thing. So, again one has to be very careful about how to utilize this fly ash that has already been dumped, how can we reclaim it and make some useful utilization out of it. So, fly ash is definitely available, it will be with us as long as thermal power plants are a reality. How much of India's power is uh, given by thermal power? Yeah, about 60 percent, yeah, 60 percent of India's power comes from burning coal. There are several countries around the world which have cut that down significantly. Realizing that, that is a big source of atmospheric pollution, you are cutting down the thermal power plants. They have started going to other uh, uh, power streams. Of course, India is investing largely into con uh, unconventional means of power also like solar and wind. Uh, we have really done very well in terms of actually increasing our capacity there, but because we are developing at such a fast rate, we cannot do away with our thermal power plants they will be there for a long time to come, right. Even if there is a coal shortage, we will import coal and still produce power using these plants. So, the power demand is going to be so high in India because we are nowhere near the power consumption of many of the developed countries. So, we are going to be a power hungry nation for a long time. Now, because of that thermal power is going to be there, so fly ash is definitely going to be there in India. In countries like the US, fly ash availability is already becoming a problem because many thermal power plants are shut down and US is blessed with 
several different types of natural resources. They have uh, gas, they have uh, uh, they have other forms of uh, uh, power. For for instance, they they have lots of reserves, obviously, of oil, so they can actually even burn oil and make power. So for them, it's not really a big deal because the country is so vast, and they have to support a population that is one third of our country. Actually, now one fourth of our country. The size of the U.S. is nearly, I think, seven times the size of India, area-wise, and uh, population is uh, one fourth. So they have 28 times the advantage <laughs> of India. So anyway, uh, so what I wanted to say is that you are facing a very different situation in these places. Now, blast furnace slag is obviously available wherever steel is getting manufactured. And uh, this blast furnace slag, the quantities are obviously going to be limited as compared to that of fly ash. Right? Steel manufacture produces slag uh, approximately, I think, uh, I, uh, if I am getting my number right, about 1 ton of processing of steel, of, of actual steel that you get in the end, produces an equivalent amount of slag as a material. Okay, so, 1 ton of slag from 1 ton of steel. Now, that slag has very good use immediately in construction as a replacement material for cement and we will see that it is used in much larger replacement levels also, but there is only limited quantities available. Natural pozzolana. Volcanic ash, siliceous volcanic ash. That is where the term, term pozzolana basically is from where? It is from a place called Pozzuoli in Italy. So, they use the ash from uh, the eruption of Mount Etna. Okay, that was long time back. They used the ash as a ingredient in lime mortar and found that it enhanced the properties of lime mortar. So, that was the first known use of pozzolana. And then of course, the Greeks also did a lot of work with uh, uh, pozzolanic additives, ash and stuff like that. Uh, and from there on of course, it spread significantly and the name itself pozzolana basically comes from Pozzuoli in Italy. Now, natural pozzolana is available everywhere. Only thing is we do not know where it is available. Why? Because these are geological uh, events, eruption of volcanoes. Uh, I do not know if you are familiar with uh, some of the later, uh, I mean, eruptions that happened in the last uh, uh, decade. What happens is the ash is very light. So, depending on the nature of the winds, the ash can form clouds and get carried to a distance which is far away from the volcano. And ultimately, this ash basically comes in deposits on the ground. And geologically, these events may happen in gaps of several tens of thousands of years, right. So, the ash deposit may be lying underneath a major overburden over which people have been living for centuries now. So, something like this uh, was also found from a location in Andhra Pradesh, where we found the er uh, ash that has been deposited from the eruption of a volcano in Indonesia. Long time back, 75,000 years ago, this eruption has happened and carried the ash all the way up to India. And we have this ash deposited and I think they were doing some other mining in the region that they discovered this material and ultimately when we evaluated this material, it had very good pozzolanic properties. It is a volcanic ash. Volcanic ash is almost amorphous, 100 percent amorphous silica. So, you can imagine it has got to have very good pozzolanic characteristics. And so, this pozzolanic material is available, but we do not know where it is available. Okay. Burnt shale, again, this is one way if you have shale deposits, they, you can actually, uh, when you burn them to produce, burnt shale is also used for production of power and uh, burnt shale can also be a good source of silica, but then the quantity is a very small silica fume again, it is obtained from manufacture of or uh, production of silicon metal from ferrosilicon alloys. And the silica fume again is collected in quantities that are not large enough to really make a major difference. Rice is cash, processing of rice, you remove the husk, you burn the husk because it gives you a lot of energy, but then the ash that get, gets remained has very interesting pozzolanic characteristics because of the silica that is present in it. And that ash can also be used as cement replacement material. But all of these are present in extremely small quantities and not really utilizable in a very large extent. 
one thing that is possibly available is clay. Again, we need to have a clear estimate of how much clay is actually available in the earth's crust and where all it is available in a form that can produce material that is reactive and realizable as a cement replacement. So, what we need to do is obviously, we cannot use clays directly in concrete because, because what, what would clays do directly in concrete? Yeah, some clays are of the swelling type, obviously you cannot put too much swelling material in, in your system. Kaolinity clays are not necessarily the swelling type, but still putting a soft material like a clay in your system is not really going to help a lot. If you can calcine it, you release the alumina and the silica and these become available for pozzolanic reaction. And then you produce calcium aluminosilicate hydrate, which has excellent characteristics as a pore filling uh, CSH phase which can lead to much improved performance. So, again metakaolin or calcined kaolinate clay, it need not be metakaolin, I will tell you the difference when we get come to that section of the chapter. So, calcined clays have a very large potential for utilization as supplementary cementing material and this is something that a lot of the people in the world are now working on, different types of calcined clays because you can always not get kaolinitic clays all the time. So, sometimes you have to work with mixed sources of clays and that may affect the kind of performance that you get out of these clay systems.